Well, thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to visit and talk to you this morning about uh, autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, Jean-Louis mentioned we met in the 80s. Many things have changed in the last 30-something years. When I first met him, he was complaining about traveling to the United States and how bad the coffee was in the United States, and he referred to it as sock juice, which I think was a pretty accurate description at that time. Of course, Starbucks has changed that now, and imagine traveling to Paris now and seeing Starbucks uh, uh, here in uh, Paris. So. Uh, I hope that's not uh, been too negative impact on the coffee in France. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk first about the, uh, I guess I should stay here since you're videotaping. I'll try not to move around too much. Uh, in autism and autism spectrum disorders, all clinical experts, and I'm, do we have some clinical autism experts here? A few love to say and have a slide often that say if you've seen one child with autism you've seen one child meaning they're all different and there's tremendous clinical heterogeneity now in the last uh, five or so years genetics has provided additional support for that notion first with copy number variants showing that there are many different de novo and other copy number variants and then from whole exome sequencing in 2012 and the conclusion of most of the genetics experts in autism is there are at least 500, probably 1,000 or more different single genes that when mutated can cause or give a very high risk for autism and autism spectrum disorders. So, but I think clinically sometimes and in clinical research and other research, people don't put these two facts together that there are many different diseases in autism, so how do you study it? For me, the simplistic notion, if you're doing phenotypic studies of autism or intervention studies, either behavioral intervention or pharmacologic intervention, and you do a study with 30 children with autism, you're really doing a study of one child each of 30 different disorders. So it shouldn't be surprising when the response to treatment is extremely variable among these 30 different disorders. And sometimes I make the analogy to how we thought about cancer in the 1960s when we thought about developing a drug for cancer as if cancer was one disorder. And now we know, at least in some cases, subdividing cancer based on genomic profile allows information for developing specific uh, uh, drug targets based on the underlying genetic mutations. And so we think uh, that a better approach to understanding both the etiology, pathophysiology, and then optimizing treatment in autism and related disorders will be to look at genetic subtypes. So some people refer to this as a genotype first or genomics first approach. This is a review by Evan Eichler. <coughs> And we'll talk uh, uh, today about both rare genetic mutations with large effect size and also background effects and uh, genetic modifiers and their influence on autism. So at Geisinger, and I'll talk a little bit more about the structure of Geisinger this afternoon for those of you who are able to uh, come here about our precision medicine project. We have an Autism and Developmental Medicine Institute, so it's largely pediatrics, but sees a broad variety of children with developmental delay, intellectual disabilities, autism, uh, ADHD, epilepsy. Uh, it's a, a um, combined clinical services and clinical research. We re refer to Geisinger as a learning health system. I'll talk a little bit more about that this afternoon, meaning we try to recruit and engage all of our patients and their families into research during their routine clinic visits. And there's an evolving uh, ethical framework in the United States that healthcare systems and hospitals and physicians, other healthcare providers, and even patients have a duty to participate in research. Not an option, not separate, but a duty to particip participate in research to increase our knowledge to take better care of the next patient that comes into clinic. 
So in our autism and developmental medicine clinic, we try to recruit 100% of the families into clinical research. Our consent rates to participate are well over 90% of all patients and families agree. The clinical services include genomics, brain imaging, developmental pediatrics, psychiatry, psychology, pediatric neurology. Our research is broad neuroscience, behavioral research, bioinformatics, uh, genomics, and we're setting up a large clinical trials program as well. Um, <clears throat> I'll explain this a little bit later in the talk. We like to think of this broad array of developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism, uh, pediatric epilepsy, and adult schizophrenia as developmental brain disorders. And just using routine genetic testing by chromosome microarray and now whole exome sequencing as a clinical genetic test that's available and reimbursed by insurance companies in our system. Uh, up to 40% of these children, we can identify the specific <coughs> genetic cause, either de novo copy number variant, a micro deletion, micro duplication, or a de novo point mutation in a single gene uh, that causes uh, autism or related um, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, I'm going to spend a lot of my time talking about uh, copy number variation or CNVs. These are really just a new name for cytogenetic micro deletions and micro duplications. I'm going to focus primarily on recurrent copy number variants. These are the ones where we have hot spots in our genome, hot spots in the karyotype that have a higher frequency of deletion and duplication where the breakpoints are consistent. I'll focus on these for simplicity because it's possible to get 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 children with exactly the same genetic mutation. And then we can do comprehensive phenotyping on 100 children with exactly the same genetic mutation to decrease the heterogeneity that you see when you look at uh, autism and neurodevelopmental disorders broadly. Uh, I'm not sure the status in Europe, but in the United States, whole genome chromosome microarray has become the standard of care testing for all children uh, with unexplained developmental delay, intellectual disabilities, uh, autism, uh, with or without multiple congenital anomalies. This has replaced the G-banded karyotype. This was based on an expert consensus panel statement in 2010, and our American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics uh, issued a practice guideline later in the same year uh, endorsing this uh, expert consensus panel, saying we should stop doing G-bended karyotype as the primary diagnostic test. We should do whole genome chromosome microarray as the first tier genetic test for any child with unexplained developmental abnormalities. <clears throat> this is the American College of uh, Medical Genetics recommendation, and it includes non-syndromic developmental delay intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorders. This has also been adopted by the American Academy of Pediatrics in their autism toolkit that says chromosome microarray should be offered to all patients uh, with um, uh, uh, unexplained autism spectrum disorder. So this is now standard of care in the United States. Doesn't mean that all physicians order the test appropriately. Doesn't mean that every child gets it, but it is the recommended guidelines by the genetics, medical genetics community and by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So why is it important to have the genetic etiology when a child has autism or autism spectrum disorders? We know that uh, children who have clinical features of autism may have an underlying genetic condition uh, such as Fragile X or 22Q11.2 deletions, previously called uh, DeGeorge syndrome or velocardiofacial syndrome, or they can have a chromosome 15 deletion or mutation causing Angelman syndrome. These are very different rare genetic conditions and they have different Clinical medical comorbidities, they have different prognosis in terms of their developmental outcomes, and they have different uh, optimal methods of learning. So the uh, individual education program as well as the individual medical management can be very different uh, 
depending on the underlying genetic etiology. One example is the chromosome 15 duplication, one of the most common genetic causes of autism. A little bit less than 1% of individuals with autism spectrum disorder have this duplication of chromosome 15. Uh, it's inherited from the mother. This is a genomically imprinted region if it's inherited from the father. There's no phenotypic abnormality. What's important is you can have phenotypically uh, unaffected females who are carriers of this duplication who now have a 50% risk uh, of a child inheriting the maternal duplication uh, and having autism. That means in subsequent pregnancies, this couple has a 50% recurrence risk, not the typical 5 to 10% recurrence risk that we counsel families who have one child with autism for whom you don't know the specific genetic etiology. So for uh, adjusting the recurrence risk counseling information for a couple with one child with autism, knowing the underlying genetic etiology, fortunately, most of the genetic mutations that cause autism are de novo events, meaning the increased risk in subsequent pregnancies is not increased. You can actually lower the recurrence risk counseling for most cases after you find a specific genetic mutation. So how do we interpret whole genome microarray uh, karyotype or molecular karyotype analysis? There are recommendations from the American College of Medical Genetics and others and um, uh, we look first in the literature and databases to see if there are uh, similar cases already reported, the Decipher database, now the ClinVar database uh, in the US. Uh, if there are no similar cases, then we have to use clinical judgment in the laboratory, similar to karyotype interpretation, and we do that based on the size of the microdeletion, size of the duplication, and the number of genes that are included and whether the deletion or duplication is inherited or de novo. Uh, there are many data sharing efforts and new databases uh, in the US and in Europe, uh, particularly Decipher, ClinVar, uh, to try to accumulate more evidence base to interpret microdeletions and microduplications or copy number variants to determine which ones are pathogenic and which ones are benign. Now, <clears throat> we now know from clinical chromosome microarray testing which are the most common recurrent microdeletions and microduplications in humans. And it turns out that the uh, DeGeorge Velocardiofacial Syndrome 22Q11.2 deletion is the most common. So, one in 167 in a clinical population referred for microarray testing. So this is children with unexplained, undiagnosed developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism, et cetera, referred for genetic testing. The frequency is one in 167. The second most common is deletion of 16P11.2, which I'll talk more about. Not quite as common as uh, 22Q11. And you can see the decreasing frequency uh, across this list of but over in the far right column, I've highlighted in yellow that some of these microdeletions are also found in the, quote, normal population. So if you do a general population survey and do a whole genome chromosome microarray, you'll find examples of these deletions and duplications in people who think they are normal and are walking around without a medical diagnosis of intellectual disability uh, or autism. Uh, but there are several lines of evidence that show that the presence of these microdeletions do cause cognitive impairment and behavioral problems, even though the individual doesn't have a diagnosis, uh, a clinical diagnosis. So I'm going to digress a little bit here to talk about uh, these genetics terms that all geneticists use in textbooks, and we use them when we're giving seminars. But we're usually not very careful about telling you when we're talking about variable expressivity or incomplete penetrance. And the use of these terms also depends on what kind of phenotype you're talking about. Are you really talking about a dichotomous yes-no phenotype? 
or a continuous uh, phenotype. So the formal definition for variable expressivity is range of phenotype or range of severity from mild to severe in individuals with the same genetic etiology. Incomplete penetrance, we usually mean some individuals with a cupping over variant or a single nucleotide variant, so point mutation or sequence uh, variant, are apparently unaffected, although we know in genetics sometimes when we study the parent who also carries the same copy number variant or single gene mutation, they have very subtle or mild features of the condition, but no diagnosis was made. But the other important part is we tend in medicine to treat everything as if it's a qualitative dichotomous trait. So we talk about intellectual disability or normal, and we talk about a child having autism spectrum disorder or normal, as if there's only two possibilities, two states, and it's yes, no, as opposed to quantitative continuous trait or dimensional trait that follows a normal or Gaussian distribution in the general population, and as I'll discuss, cognitive performance, many behavioral traits, and even motor performance follow a more continuous distribution in the general population, and there's lots of variability in the general normal population. And the best example of this uh, is IQ. Uh, for all of the social and cultural biases and problems with IQ testing, it's still an extremely well-studied trait and uh, correlates with cognitive performance in a variety of ways. And as you know, we uh, create a mean IQ of 100, and the standard deviation is 15, and the distribution in the general population is a relatively normal uh, distribution. And then for educational purposes, and for medical purposes, we sort of arbitrarily draw a cutoff, and that's usually two standard deviations below the mean, or IQ 70 and below, we refer to as intellectual disability. Now, this is not the only criterion for uh, clinical diagnosis of intellectual disability, but it's one of the major uh, features uh, for that diagnosis. Now, for traditional genetic disorders associated with intellectual disability, there's no problem uh, in the notion of talking about clinical variability and penetrance. What I mean by that is children with Down syndrome due to trisomy 21 or fragile X syndrome have a mean IQ that's three or four standard deviations shifted to the left. So the cognitive impairment is severe, three to four standard deviations. There's still variability in IQ among these individuals, and there are even a few individuals with Down syndrome or Fragile X who formally test in the normal IQ range. And these so-called high-functioning Down syndrome or high-functioning Fragile X syndrome we're okay with because it's only a few people. For the most part, we know these are intellectual disability disorders with only a rare exception to that. But look what happens now when we look at a copy number variant or microdeletion syndrome like 22Q11.2. The mean IQ is now 70 and the standard deviation is 13. So you get a normal distribution that overlaps now significantly with the normal IQ range. But notice there's nobody over here. So, and in textbooks now, deletion 22Q11.2 is often held up as the prototype for incomplete penetrance. Because we know when you have a child with a 22Q11 deletion in the lab, and then you test the parents to see if it's de novo or inherited, 10% of the time, one of the parents has it. When the lab calls the physician to report the parent's result and says one of the parents has the same deletion in the child, before the lab can say who, the physician often says, I know which parent has the deletion because they met the parents. And they know that one of the parents didn't do very well in school 
different from everybody else in the family of that parent, right? And we call that incomplete penetrance because that parent doesn't have a diagnosis and thinks they're normal until you have the laboratory confirmation of 22Q11.2. So for me, this is not incomplete penetrance. This mutation causes a two standard deviation deleterious effect on cognitive performance and shifts the entire population two standard deviations to the left. So I view this as variable expressivity, not incomplete penetrance. Now what contributes to the variability? So we still have variability. I said standard deviation is 13. It's the same standard deviation that we have in the general population. So <clears throat> now what we didn't have until recently, and I'll save the slide until later, is do these children on the low end of the IQ distribution with deletion 22, are they related to the parents on this end of the IQ distribution? And are these children with very high functioning 22Q deletion related to the parents over here? Would be a reasonable hypothesis that the parental genetic and environmental background could influence the out developmental outcome for the child. We have a little bit of data now on that. Another uh, important study came from DECODE in Iceland a couple of years ago, looking at uh, 20 or 25, they called them neuropsychiatric CNVs. So copy number variants that were known to give increased risk of autism and schizophrenia, as well as intellectual disability. This was on over 100,000 people, so more than a third of the entire population of Iceland. And they looked at people in the general population with these CNVs who did not have any medical diagnosis of intellectual disability, autism, or schizophrenia. And they brought them in and did IQ testing and other testing. And the results were very interesting. So here's the normal population mean here in black. So mean at zero for IQ and various behavioral testing. So adaptive behavioral testing, social testing. <clears throat> and then the scale here is standard deviations of impairment. So higher scores are bad. Red is a clinical cohort of schizophrenia individuals and schizophrenia is known to have decreased IQ. So here 1.5 to two standard deviation decreased IQ compared to the normal general population. <clears throat> and for other behavioral and social traits. In blue are individuals with no clinical diagnosis of schizophrenia, autism, intellectual disability, but who have a copy number variant one of these neuropsychiatric, and they're intermediate between the general population and the schizophrenia population. So that means if you have a microdeletion or microduplication, even if you don't have a medical diagnosis of autism, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, formal testing will show an impairment, a deleterious impact of this genetic mutation uh, in a general population assessment. So when I come back and talk in some detail about 16P11.2 deletion uh, associated with autism, and this was from New England Journal of Medicine, reported in 2008, everybody got very excited that this copy number variant might be a great model for autism because early on it looked like a very strong association or risk for autism. So the Simons Foundation, in, based in New York, uh, set up a very large study with the goal to identify at least 100 children who had exactly the same copy number variant, deletion 16P11.2, and their parents and their siblings, so entire nuclear families, and do comprehensive clinical evaluation phenotyping on them. So <clears throat> you see when you look at IQ, and this was at the time they had 81 individuals with the deletion, you see a, a distribution of IQ with a mean of 81, and you look at the parental in red, 
the mean parental IQ was a little bit above the normal IQ range, and you see a shift to the left in the distribution of the individuals with deletion 16p11.2 compared to the parents and other siblings who don't have the deletion. Now, <clears throat> initially when the Simons Foundation started looking at the data and the frequency of autism spectrum disorder, using very strict formal criteria, uh, ADOS and ADI measurements, uh, <clears throat> only 21% of the children who had this deletion had autism, so they were very disappointed that this might not be such a good model for autism. But look in the next column, if you look at other dsm 4 at this time, diagnostic codes for other psychiatric diagnoses, 98% of these children had two or more, most of them had three or more psychiatric diagnoses. So they didn't have autism by ADI ADOS, but they weren't uh, completely free of psychiatric diagnoses, and in fact only one child out of the first 67 had no dsm 4 psychiatric diagnosis. So is this low penetrance for autism, or is this very, very high penetrance for psychiatric disorder, but we just can't predict exactly which dsm 4 bucket any individual child is going to uh, end up in. So, <clears throat> so we've tried to start looking at this notion of what accounts for the variability, um, and actually i also comment here. Uh, there was initially some concern when we started looking at every clinical feature in the deletion. The idea was if we looked at 100 children with exactly the same deletion, do we reduce the heterogeneity? When we got 100 children with exactly the same deletion, they were still variable, and we were surprised by that, until Kathy Lord actually pointed out that the standard deviation on IQ and other features was 15. It was the same standard deviation as in the general population. If you look at all autism, by all causes, the standard deviation in IQ is 30. So twice as much variability across all autism than in the general population. So what accounts for this clinical heterogeneity? So in all genetic conditions, you have multiple factors contributing. You have the type and severity of the individual mutation. If it's a point mutation in a gene, it can be a complete loss of function, can be a partial, partial loss of function. So you can have mild or severe mutations in an individual gene. Uh, <coughs> uh, depending on the type of inheritance, if you have a mutation in a single copy of the gene, you can have variable expression in the remaining normal or wild type allele. And most importantly, but also most difficult to study, is variation in modifier genes. So one or a small number of genes with very large effect size on a trait, or genetic background. By that I mean many genes with small effect size, so so-called common alleles, common complex uh, genetics trait. Um, because we've simplified our analysis by getting 100 or more children with exactly the same mutation, we can eliminate the type and severity of mutation. So for copy number variants, with exactly the same breakpoints, they delete exactly the same genes. So we have 100 children with functionally identical mutations, and now we want to do uh, clinical studies. So we've taken uh, a little bit uh, different approach of the Simons Foundation data, and now we've looked at only the de novo cases of deletions, right? So we've eliminated the inherited cases, and looking only at the de novo cases, now IQ is plotted here for the parents in red, for the unaffected siblings or unaffected children of these parents, and the unaffected children map pretty close to the IQ of the parents with maybe a slight regression to the mean effect, as you might expect. Now look at the mean and distribution of de novo 
16p deletions only, shown here. So the average deleterious effect size, so for me, this is a pretty good estimate of the effect size of the mutation because I've only looked at known de novo cases of this microdeletion. <coughs> So the effect size on cognitive performance is almost two standard deviations. In addition to that, we did a correlation analysis between the children and their parents and first degree relatives. So the intra-class correlation between each individual child and their individual parents and unaffected SIBs is 0.42. This is similar to the correlation and IQ of a typical child and their parents. So the best single predictor of a typical child's IQ is the biparental mean, their parents' mean IQ, best single predictor. So that says that the children with deletion 16 P11 with IQ in the normal range and even above 100 are related to the parents with very high IQ. And the children with de novo deletion 16 with intellectual disability come from the, are related to the parents with low normal IQ. Now we can't dissect the genetic and environmental contribution uh, specifically, but we can make the correlation and say something about the family background influences the child. And this raises the whole notion in our own research of not looking at genetic mutation and their effects, their phenotypic effects compared to the population norm, but look at the mutation effects compared to the family background and not the population. So we do the same thing now with social behavior. So the SRS or social responsiveness scale is a me quantitative measure of social ability, social communication, social adaptivity, Activity developed by John Constantino with very good population norms, very good heritability estimates. So like IQ, this is very highly heritable trait. In this case, uh, higher scores are bad and a lower score is good. So you see the parents in blue here in the Simons Foundation. <coughs> You see their unaffected children or unaffected siblings to the probands map very closely to the parents. But now the probands with deletion, de novo deletion, are shifted two standard deviations in the deleterious direct direction. So they don't all have autism. Those at the extreme far right got a clinical diagnosis of autism with ADOS ADI. Everybody else did not get, remember, 80% don't have a clinical diagnosis, but they have impaired social skills compared to not having the deletion. <clears throat> if you look at the intra-class correlation, 0.52, again, very similar to the correlation in typical children and their parents for this SRS, social uh, ability, meaning that the children who ended up with a clinical diagnosis of autism are related to the parents who have the worst social skills. So we call this the MIT effect in the United States for the famous university with computer science and engineers that have a much increased risk of autism among children of the faculty members at MIT. <clears throat> Uh, we also see this with motor function, the pegboard, um, pegboard, I forget the name, pegboard something test, which is a measure of fine motor and gross motor skills. Again, you see a 1.2 standard deviation deleterious effect, so poorer motor coordination, motor skills, uh, and a positive intra-class correlation meaning these children are related to these parents and these children related to these parents. It turns out for every cognitive, behavioral, and psychiatric measure that you test on these children, there's a one to two standard deviation deleterious impact associated with this de novo deletion. 
and the resulting score for the child correlates to the family score. Can I ask one? Yes, you can ask one question. Is it true also for the obesity, which is... Yes, and I think I took that slide out, but it's also true for the obesity phenotype in this particular disorder, and the effect size was one standard deviation, not two, one or a little bit over one, uh, and the interclass correlation was also positive. So exactly the same, uh, but I took that slide out. I think it's uh, in the published version. So. Um, so we thought this approach to looking at family background was pretty cool, but in genetics, like in most areas of science, it's very difficult to do anything novel. Um, so after we had done this work and started writing the paper and doing literature review, we found out people thought about the parental background <clears throat> from 1974 uh, was the earliest publication. So you know that 45X Turner syndrome is associated with short stature. These publications from 1974 say the tallest Turner syndrome individuals come from the tallest parents and the shortest Turner syndrome individuals come from the shortest parents. My clinician colleague says, everybody knows that, but scientifically we don't think about it on a regular basis. And then in Down syndrome, studies of uh, IQ uh, as well as height show the same thing. So for IQ, the uh, degree of impairment on IQ or the effect size is three to five standard deviations but you see strong correlation of the resulting IQ in a Down syndrome individual correlates with the biparental mean IQ. So the high functioning Down syndrome children are from parents with very high IQ. And the same is true for Prader-Willi syndrome, again for height uh, and for IQ. So we uh, published this in uh, JAMA Psychiatry. It came out online at the end of, uh, uh, in December 14 and in print a few months after that and called it the role of parental cognitive behavioral motor profiles in clinical variability. Uh, I s sent the paper to all my psychiatry, psychology colleagues at Geisinger along with a nice editorial by Eric Morrow, a child psychologist at Brown in the United States. Uh, he called it quantifying the effects of rare variants in pedigrees. How far does the apple fall from the tree? When I sent it to my colleagues, the people I sent it to passed it on to more and they said, look at this interesting research from uh, Dr. Ledbetter's group, but particularly read the editorial because it's written in language that psychiatrists and psychologists can understand. So he took out the data and the statistical analysis and explained uh, in uh, very nice lay terms that you have a genetic mutation of large effect size, but that mutation lives on a family background and that family's genetic and environmental background will influence the resulting developmental performance uh, of each individual child. So I told you on 22Q11, we didn't have data until more recently, and this paper was published in 2014, that shows the relationship between the IQ score of probands with deletion 22Q11.2 and their relatives are consistent uh, with those reported in other genetic syndromes, as I've just alluded to, meaning correlation between proband IQ and their relatives um, and were consistent across time. So very significant positive correlation between the IQ of a child with deletion 22Q11.2 and their unaffected parents uh, and family members. So we have this data for Down syndrome, trisomy 21, Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, 16P11.2 and 22Q11.2. We need more data, but we think that this will likely be the, the pattern and the rule rather than the exception.
Another feature of clinical variability that's been commented on by Jonathan Sabat and many other uh, authors uh, in Europe as well as the US, uh, this was about schizophrenia. We have rare uh, copy number variants, structural variants uh, with one disorder, schizophrenia, uh, one disorder with multiple different mutations, but we also have the same mutation with multiple different disorders. So our group did a commentary or perspective and we use the term developmental brain dysfunction. This is, has a lot of similarities to Essence from Christopher Gilberg. <coughs> um, and this was published in uh, Lancet Neurology. And in that we reviewed the growing list of copy number variants that are identified in children with developmental delay or intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorders, pediatric uh, early onset forms of epilepsy and adults with schizophrenia. So the same copy number variant ascertained with individuals with very different DSM-4 diagnostic criteria and geneticists now love to say that genes and copy number variants don't read the DSM-4 classification, so they don't respect the categorical boundaries between these disorders. In the same review, we talked about the growing list of individual genes that when mutated cause developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism, pediatric epilepsy, and adult schizophrenia. When you start thinking about this whole r clinical range of intellectual disability, autism, uh, adult psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, it has some profound genetic counseling uh, implications, because it's, it's not atypical in genetics to take a pedigree and find this sort of mixture of different psychiatric presentations, intellectual disability, developmental delay, autism, etc. And by doing underlying genetic testing, find this is a fairly typical Fragile X pedigree. So in the past, if the diagnoses didn't match, you would say, huh, that's a pretty unlucky family and may not pursue genetic testing and formal genetic evaluation. So we're now trying to think in our own center, but also how to um, uh, promote this idea in taking a pedigree, doing family history. If you have a neurodevelopmental disorder across any of these typical clinical diagnostic buckets, you should not dismiss them as unrelated, unlucky events, but potentially part of the same genetic condition. Now I want to come back to uh, uh, the idea that I've um, brought up now, and that is when these copy number variants and single gene mutations associated with autism first came out, everybody was puzzled. Why is it that one child will, with the same exact genetic mutation will have intellectual disability, but not autism. And a different child with exactly the same mutation will have autism, but not intellectual disability. So we have a model and the model says, look at the family background uh, and then maybe you can start to understand it and not yet, but maybe you can make some predictions. So if we look at IQ or cognitive development in this model. So the upper panel is one family, one proband, and the expected IQ for any child is the biparental mean. So here the parent's mean IQ is just below uh, average IQ. Now if you have a de novo mutation with a two standard deviation effect size, the child's IQ observed here might cross a clinical threshold. So the red dotted line is IQ 70 or a clinical threshold. And so this child has intellectual disability. But suppose in the same family, these two parents have pretty good social skills. And so their SRS or uh, other social scales are above average. And you have a deleterious uh, impact due to the mutation, 
the observed social skills of the child will be less than the parents, but not bad enough to cross the clinical threshold and get a diagnosis of autism. Now let's look at this family in the bottom. Here, the parents have poor social skills, so low normal, so they don't have a diagnosis of autism, but they're low normal, not very good social skills, and the mutation now crosses the line and you get a clinical diagnosis of autism. But these same parents have very high IQ. So when you subtract two standard deviations because of this mutation, the IQ is still in the normal range, maybe not what the parents were hoping for, given the family background, but uh, well within normal IQ range. So we use this model now to say, can you actually look at the parents' cognitive performance, social behavior, and make any clinically useful predictions about what the child's future strengths and weaknesses might be? And this is my favorite uh, uh, publication title from Brenda Finucan, a genetic counselor. Shift happens, meaning you have a family background, you have a mutation that shifts performance in a deleterious direction by one or two standard deviations. And the question is, with a disorder like 22Q11, where some get a diagnosis of intellectual disability, some get a diagnosis of autism, and fully 25% get a diagnosis of schizophrenia when they are adults, can we predict which ones are going to grow up to be schizophrenia? Can we predict which ones are at higher risk for autism? And the answer is not yet, but we're intrigued by this idea. Um, <clears throat> so we're intrigued by using family studies to help predict phenotypic manifestations and ultimately whether this might be clinically useful and we could customize just like we have individualized educational plans or programs, IEPs. We'll have individual developmental and individual medical programs and plans based on the child's mutation, but also the other family background information. The illustrations Brenda used uh, in this publication show a typical family here in blue with the uh, average or slightly below uh, the mean IQ and the child with a um, copy number variant uh, is at risk of the two standard deviation shift uh, causing intellectual disability in the child. But if the family is on the high end of the cognitive performance IQ range and you have a shift, then you might be able to predict that the resulting IQ is still going to be in the normal range and the child may be able to adapt and learn uh, better than the previous uh, family. <clears throat> there was a, um, a very recent uh, epidemiology studied in, study in JAMA Psychiatry from Ken Kindler that I thought was particularly interesting. It's been known for a long time that in adults with schizophrenia, tested IQ is below normal. Um, with a mean around uh, 80, 85, so one standard deviation or a little more shift in the average IQ. Uh, this study in Sweden was uh, looking at a million individuals who had school achievement, so how far did the individual go through high school uh, or beyond, uh, and more than 100,000 with IQ data, so social achievement or IQ data. And then they looked in adults with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and looked back at school achievement and IQ of the individual with schizophrenia, but also to their other family members. And the interesting result was that the risk of schizophrenia was most strongly predicted by the difference in IQ of the individual with schizophrenia and their family not by the absolute IQ, but by the difference. Now, they don't talk about it in this paper, but this would be consistent with rare de novo mu genetic mutations uh, 
being a large enough part of this population of schizophrenia to account uh, for this shift or deviation in IQ from familial. I think it could be useful, we don't have enough data yet to say, when should we do genetic testing in adults with schizophrenia? I've always had the just vague notion that if IQ is below, I don't know, 90, below 80, you should do genetic testing because you're enriching for the possibility of a rare genetic mutation as the etiology of the brain disorder, including schizophrenia. But I think this could be uh, a useful way. And now this says it's not the absolute IQ, but is it uh, the person with schizophrenia is very different from their other family members, which would suggest a genetic etiology and a de novo mutation as the most likely etiology. So I'll briefly mention one more recent study that we've done, uh, also published in JAMA Psychiatry. So there are many, many different candidate genes for um, autism, uh, intellectual disability, and schizophrenia. We did just a sort of meta-analysis uh, taking this cross disorder approach. So many people have done whole exome sequencing on a cohort of children with intellectual disability and whole exome sequencing on a different cohort with autism and whole exome sequencing on a different cohort with schizophrenia. And usually if there are three or more clear pathogenic inactivating mutations in a gene within a study, it's called uh, statistically significant and becomes a candidate gene for intellectual disability or autism or schizophrenia. But if there's only one mutation, that mutation is in the supplementary, supplementary materials uh, on, available online, but is not a candidate gene. So we did something really simple, and that is take all studies of intellectual disability, pediatric epilepsy, autism and schizophrenia and look through the supplemental materials for every individual uh, de novo mutation. And when you do that, uh, you identify 17 new candidate genes that were not identified uh, by the studies because they were just individual cases in the supplemental material. Um, if we treat all four clinical diagnostic categories as uh, developmental brain disorders, we identified 17 additional candidate genes. This doesn't project very well. It's supposed to be a radar plot showing uh, which of these genes are most associated with autism, and there's a reddish color corresponding to CHD8, one of the chromatin uh, domain genes that gives a very high risk of autism, as well as uh, GRIN2B here, and uh, there's another one, and SCN2A. And then in green, those that are more specific to risk of uh, pediatric epilepsy, including some of the sodium channel genes. And then the blue or purple color is all of these uh, give a very high increased risk of developmental delay, uh, intellectual disability. And we've created a publicly available website, Geisinger ADMI, our Autism Developmental Medicine Institute org, developmental brain disorder genes. Now this is a very conservative list. It's about 300 genes because we're using only clear loss of function mutations, so not including any missense mutations and predominantly de novo mutations, but across four different disorders to create this developmental brain disorder. So the themes that I've talked about today is a genetics first approach that etiology matters clinically and for our research approach, and that instead of using these qualitative um, uh, dichotomous traits, if we looked at quantitative traits and the National Institute of Mental Health has a new emphasis on dimensional traits, the so-called RDOC project, are more powerful and meaningful. And it's really ironic to remind my genetic colleagues to think about doing family studies instead of 
cohort studies and case control studies and ignore the rich genetic background information, family background information available from family-based studies. Uh, and also, as I alluded to, a learning health system where we are uh, in our clinic, we have uh, clinical medical information, behavioral testing, brain imaging, everything that's done on a clinical basis becomes part of a research database. So we view all clinical and phenotypic data is free. So it's a byproduct of patient care. We just have to catch it and store it in a database that's accessible for research purposes. And we think increasingly genomics data, because we do whole genome microarray, chromosome microarray testing on a clinical basis, the insurance company pays for that, so it's free. And now we have approval to do whole exome sequencing when the whole genome microarray is normal. So we do microarray whole exome sequencing on every patient. And because they're pediatric cases that benefit from interpretation of the family, we do trios. So we do the parents and both child, everything paid by insurance. So it's free, free data for our research uh, project. So the summary points, the same genetic mutations can be seen in individuals with intellectual disabilities, autism, epilepsy, schizophrenia. So we call this developmental brain disorders. So it's time to reconsider, maybe abandon for research purposes, maybe not for clinical purposes, artificial categorical classification, DSM, uh, and move to dimensional quantitative. And the NIH, again, is encouraging researchers with NIH funding to move away from categorical diagnosis. So don't submit an NIH grant on autism, submit an NIH grant on cognitive performance, social performance, these dimensional traits. So, and I think this dichotomization actually confuses because you lose so much information when you put things into normal, abnormal categories that you're actually um, uh, obfuscating the actually rich biological data uh, present. Uh, and family studies, including cognitive behavioral profiles, can help to identify family background contributions to variability and may someday, not yet, be clinically useful in predicting phenotypic man manifestations. And we think about that in terms of relative strengths and weaknesses, what the parents should look for and which areas the child may learn best. Um, <clears throat> And we're developing a clinical trials model, again, where we look at only individual genetic subtypes of autism and neurodevelopmental disorders in response to pharmacologic treatment or intensive behavioral treatment. And I'll just acknowledge my longtime collaborator, Crystalise Martin, uh, and many other people, and I'll stop there and answer any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>